ready to start, Brandon? We are ready. Well, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you for uh, spending some time with us. You know, there's so many things we could be doing. Um, we promise you, you'll not only be entertained in the next hour or so, but uh, you'll find it enlightening and informative. I'm Larry Gelwix. Uh, some of you know me as the getaway guru on the radio and on KUTV. It's my pleasure to serve as CEO at Columbus Travel along with my business partner, Mark Faldmo. We're the co-owners of Columbus Travel. Uh, I'd like to welcome two dear friends of mine, Brandon Oscarson, uh, who you think is in Giza right now, Egypt, but actually he's in Phoenix. <laughs> I like that background. Brandon is the business development manager for Ama Waterways, which is a five-star deluxe over the top, flat out my favorite river cruise company. They of course sail in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, but most, uh, most of their cruises are in Europe, the Europe rivers, the Danube, the Seine, the Rhine and others. Uh, we're also joined by, I don't know how I, I can have a better friend than Dan Hone. Uh, Dan and I have been uh, very close friends since we sat together in college classes a million years ago, and we have worked together since that time. Uh, for some 33 years, Dan was with uh, Brigham Young University in the Department of Ancient Scripture, and also with the Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Study, Studies, got his graduate degree in Israel, uh, lived there, was one of the founding members of the Jerusalem Center, sometimes called the BYU Center, uh, the Jerusalem Center, but actually the Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. What we're going to do tonight is take the first half hour or so, and uh, Brandon's going to lead us through a slide presentation. As, as uh, you know, uh, Kathy and I will be leading a uh, an exciting tour to Egypt, the secrets of Egypt and the Nile, March 18th to the 29th of 20, next year, 2022. Um, as of this morning, there were only two cabins left on the ship. And I anticipate those will go pretty quickly. The good news is, and I'll remind you of this at the end, we have added two new departures. Uh, a March 11th departure. I will not be hosting that one because they overlap. Uh, the the, the uh, tour is not only a an eight-day, seven-night Nile River cruise, but we have a land portion also. We also have uh, a, a uh, March 24th departure, 2023. And I might just add that uh, those prices are going to go up, but until they publish them, we are locked in on the 2022 prices. Sometime tonight, both of those brochures will be at columbusvacations.com. But I'd like to welcome Dan. Dan and I lead Holy Land groups together. We've worked together for almost 50 years now. And guess what? We're still the best of friends. That's so right. with that, Brandon, lead us through what we can expect on any one of these three Egypt and Nile cruises, uh, all three of us will be doing some commentary on the tour and the cruise, and that'll be about 30, 35 minutes worth. Then Dan and I are going to jump in and talk about some unique features, uh, unique features of this cruise and tour, some of the interesting highlights about the sites of Egypt. I, we've been requested to talk about um, some Egyptian temple ceremonies that I, I referenced on my radio show, sometimes called the Egyptian enthronement or Egyptian endowment. And then after all of that, we'll take questions for you. It'll last about an hour. So Brandon, lead us in the slides. And again, thank you folks for joining us. And thank you so much. It's great to be here with everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and start talking about all of these exciting things. And as Larry mentioned, uh, for those of you who are used to river cruising, you're used to going on a seven night trip. And then, you know, you can choose to do some pre or post uh, before or after the cruise. With this itinerary, you are looking at 11 nights with us. This includes 
three nights pre in Cairo, your seven nights cruise, and one night post in Cairo. There's just too much to see and do in this part of the world to go for seven nights alone. Now, this particular itinerary uh, will start selling September of this year. So it will run September through December, then pick back up, and it runs January through May because the summer months in this part of the world, it's a little bit too warm <laughs> for us to be selling it, and nobody really wants to go there during the summer months. Uh, Larry and I have talked about this. Nobody wants to go in the summertime. Now, I love this picture of Cairo. I never thought of Cairo as, as a beautiful city. I know it's a very bustling city, but uh, there are 22 million people here, so bustling is correct. Uh, but this really gives you an overview when you get up above and you can see that you are going to an absolutely spectacular destination. And we are in no, the- No, 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 no. No, I'm gonna, I gotta go over tomorrow, I'll get one then. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, if you uh, are on here, can you do me a favor and please mute yourself so that uh, we can, uh, I'll talk <laughs> later. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, uh, so we are in the process of refurbishing a vessel. In, on the Nile River, they, they will only allow a certain number no, of- No, I vessels. won't. So we went ahead and we bought uh, a 68 stateroom vessel. We have stripped her down to the hull, oh, right three. down to the metal, and we are turning her into a beautiful, luxury, 34 stateroom vessel. And when I say luxury, she is absolutely spectacular. Uh, these are renderings. She is still being built. Uh, and if you joined our past webinar, these renderings are different. We got updates. We, we actually have a much better idea of what she is going to look like when she is finished. The sun deck beautiful. You have a nice pool. You will have lounge chairs that sit in the pool. Here is your lobby. This is the reception desk. This is where you're going to check in and you will be greeted and get to your room, your key to your room, and then you will be able to hang out in the lobby if you would like, spend some time relaxing. And as you can see, we are incorporating uh, the styles and the decor of the places that we are taking you through at this time. Uh, Brandon, let me jump in here uh, and just say Alma Waterways is in no. a class by itself. In Europe, on the Nile. No, no, no. No, no. All right. Ken, please mute yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, are, there are several good companies. It's not just one. Uh, and there's several I could tell you that you're going to have a good experience, but I'm just, this is trust Larry time. Ama is a step above in the dining room, in the service, in the, the, the furnishings, everything about them is a step above. And so that's what makes this, uh, we'll talk about the uh, five-star hotels that we stay in, but this ship and Ama is in a class by itself. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that feedback. I, I feel the same way. I've been with the company for eight years and I, I would agree. Uh, we have really set ourselves apart on a, a very high level. And I, I will tell you, this ship is probably going to be one of our most beautiful vessels in operation. Uh, looking at these renderings and what we are putting together here, it will have all of the luxuries that you would find on one of our European vessels, just a smaller and more intimate cruising experience on this particular vessel. Uh, you'll have 68 guests maximum. Uh, so what we're looking at right here, this will be your main lounge. And, and to me, the main lounge is one of the most important places on the vessel because when you're not going on excursions and you're not dining, this is where you go. This is where you're going to be for your cruise manager meetings, your evening entertainment, uh, for your uh, cocktail reception. Uh, we, every evening before dinner, we have a complimentary cocktail hour. So you spend a lot of time in the lounge. And as you can see, we are putting together absolutely stunning accommodations for you. Now, again, another one of the most important places. It's funny, people think that their stateroom is the most important place on the, the, the ship, but, but it really isn't because you go to your room to sleep and change, and then you're off on excursions, you're dining, and you're socializing with guests on the lounge. And, and I know that we're all waiting for that day where we can all get together and socialize again. Uh, as you can see, the main restaurant, again, beautiful. We are putting something very special together for you in this part of the world. And we will have 
local and continental cuisine. This way you can actually sample the cuisine from the areas that you're cruising through, but maybe you're not in the mood for something in the area that you're going through. You wanna do something that is a little more traditional. So you always have a multitude of choices. You'll have beef, chicken, fish, vegetarian options, and meals are prepared to order. So if you have dietary restrictions, it really doesn't matter what it is. I met a woman with 33 food allergies and she only cruises with us. She's done Europe, Asia, and Africa at this point. I know for a fact she'll be going to Egypt because we take such good care of her meals and above and beyond taking care of them, they're delicious. People who travel are foodies. We want you to have an amazing dining experience because if you're happy with the food, everything else falls into place very nicely. And you know, Brandon, my recommendation, you said you can sample the local or the continental. I like to take both in the same meal. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Now, I don't have a lot of images of the staterooms, but this just gives you an idea of what your room is going to look like. You have the decor. Um, the beds can be uh, two twins or one oversized queen size bed. And off to the left, I know you can't really see it, but that is a separate little sitting area. So while you're getting ready or you just want to relax, if you don't want to lay in bed, you have your own little sitting area there. Now, moving away from the ship, as I had mentioned, this starts in Cairo. Uh, we are using the Four Seasons in Cairo. It's a little bit outside of town. Uh, the, the gentleman who put this together, I love the way he put this. He said that where the Four Seasons, it, where it's located, it's tranquility in a city of chaos because it is a very bustling city, but once you get to the Four Seasons, it is tranquil, it is quiet, it is beautiful, and this is the highest rated hotel on TripAdvisor that you will find in all of Cairo. And when we take you to places like this, we want you to experience the culture but when you go to bed at night, we want you to have the same comforts you would have at home. And maybe you're going to have even better comforts. This looks more comfortable than my bedroom right now. Uh, beautiful staterooms. Uh, you have Bose stereo systems in your room. So again, when you go to bed at night, you have all the comforts you need so that you can be extra comfortable. Now, I know, uh, Larry, you wanted to talk about this. Uh, we actually... Yeah. So this is the current museum, but Dan mentioned last time that they're building a new one and it will be up and running by the time we go. Yeah, you know, I, Cairo is such an exciting city and I'm going to be very brief because we want to stay within the time constraints. Uh, everyone wants to see the Tutankhamun collection. Currently, it's in the Egyptian Museum, sometimes called the Downtown Museum, which is just a sprawling complex, uh, very neoclassical uh, architecture. It's fabulous, but it's very crowded. They started construction some years ago of a new uh, museum called the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. And they're moving the, uh, a lot of the mummies. You, uh, can, you can see Seti, you can see Ramses. Uh, and you think of the history uh, that is behind these men. And uh, so, and then there's a new museum that'll be called, so we have the Egyptian Museum downtown, the new National Museum of Egyptian Civilization partially opened in 2017 and a lot of artifacts and a lot of the mummy collection will be moved there. And then the new museum out in Giza, that's where you find the pyramids. Uh, like a suburb of, of Cairo. And the Tutankhamun collection will be there. One billion dollar uh, museum. That's how much it costs to build. 30,000 new items will be displayed that have never been seen before. And so we'll be visiting these. One of the most exciting visits in Cairo is the Khanel Khalili Bazaar. Just think of... Uh, of a Persian Middle East uh, souk is what they call it. And, uh, you know, ever have I got a deal for you? You know, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar, uh, all this. You could buy anything there. We'll actually be having lunch in one of the most famous restaurant coffee shops there in Cairo, right in the Khanel Khalili Bazaar. But it's alleyways. I find it perfectly safe. Uh, everything is negotiable. 
and you can find anything there. It is one of the great experiences of a lifetime. Some of you have been to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. Uh, I actually like this one more. Uh, the, what's that, Dan? I've been to both, and I enjoyed the one in Cairo better. All right, in one sentence, why? <clears throat> there seems to be more life in it, and it seems to bring you back closer to the culture than what I felt in the one in Istanbul. Yeah. Istanbul was basically a shop area, and that was it. It's like walking through a mall, but this is more like experiencing the country. It really is. So, well, we're going to see a lot of things in Cairo. We were spending two nights, three calendar days, two nights before the cruise. Then we fly to Luxor, which Brandon will cover. And then after the cruise, we'll come back to Cairo for a very special surprise. You'll see in this, it's a, it's like a once in a lifetime surprise when we come back to Cairo. You'll see in that. Thank you, Brandon. I'm going to mention one more thing about the coffee shop we go to. It is the known as the world's first coffee shop, public open coffee shop where you can go and dine, uh, opened in 1760, and it is considered to be one of the nicest and best restaurants you can actually go to in Cairo. It's an amazing experience. Obviously, we cannot take you to this part of the world without going to the pyramids of Giza, uh, made out of limestone and granite. And uh, they were the tallest structures. Well, the biggest one was the tallest structure in the world up until about the 14th century. Uh, what they say, the largest one has over uh, a half a million stones to build it. And you can go on tours. We don't go inside of the, the pyramids, but there are people there who can take you in, and we obviously give you plenty of free time, so if you want to go in, those are very narrow tunnels. Larry, I know you've done this. I was just going to say, and by the way, the pyramids, you, you see almost like steps. Originally, it was a flat, smooth surface over the pyramids, but uh, you can, you can uh, go in the pyramid. We don't take the whole group because it's a very narrow passageway where you're really crouched down and you're, you're almost, you're not on your hands and knees, but you're really crouched down going to the antechamber right in the middle. I think it's really cool and I'd be happy to go with people there. We just don't do it for everyone because not everyone is ambulatory to do it. And if we're gonna be right there, then we have to go to the Great Sphinx. Uh, now, last time we did this, Dan, you had mentioned something about the, how the nose of the Sphinx was removed. And I apologize, I don't remember the details. It was, had something to do with Napoleon? Yes, in fact, it was thought that it was used. You have to realize if you look at that picture, you come just below the neck. That's where the sand was at the turn of the 19th century. And from the Nile, there was a straight shot to use it as target practice. Wow, unbelievable. Uh, built uh, 2500 BC, carved out of one single stone, and uh, it took them uh, between two to three years to actually carve out. And we have something really special in store. Once we're done visiting uh, the pyramids and the Sphinx, we're going to go to the Mena House. Have either of you been to the Mena House before? Yes, I've stayed there before. Excellent. Larry? Yeah, I've also been okay. there. It is just gorgeous, and you can have lunch or dine or whatever, and you what you see in this slide is the actual view. That's not Photoshop. That's what you see. And the reason you have this beautiful view is it was an old hunting lodge for Europeans uh, back in the, uh, the 1860s. Uh, very popular. So obviously it's still in the same condition it's always been in. Uh, and you get to have a very beautiful lunch there and, and another incredible experience. And this is something unique with Alma Waterways. Yeah, I might say the Mina House was considered the place to stay of all the places, uh, particularly through the 20th century there. I used to go in to uh, stay at the Mina House as well, not just eat there. All right, well, after your time in Cairo, you go to Luxor. This is where you're going to embark on, on board the ship. Uh, and uh, this is a city of 500,000 people. Uh, you'll jump on the Amidalia here. They, they consider it to be the world's greatest open air museum. And once you get on the ship, the way your tours work, you have three Egyptologists. So normally 
with Alma Waterways, every town you stop and you have a new tour guide, you actually have three Egyptologists where you're split up into three different groups throughout the entire time, and they're going to take you on all of your tours. And one of the first stops along the way, I always, it's a Hetzutza. Yes, close, not even. That sounds good to me. This is, you know, this is a really interesting, you can see the setting here. Luxor, of course, was the ancient capital for about 500 years, from about the 16th century up to uh, about the 10th century BCE. And you'll hear that reference, BCE, uh, before the Common Era, or we just call it before Christ, but before the Common Era. Um, you know, on the east bank of the Nile are the temples. On the west bank, where we are now, were the funerary temples or burial sites. You'll have the Valley of the Kings in Luxor, or as the locals pronounce it, Luxor. Uh, this is one of my favorites, the Temple of Queen Hatshepsut. Uh, she was an interesting woman. Um, she was the daughter of Tutmos I, and that goes back to the uh, Tutmos reign for, gosh, about almost 90 years, born in 1520 uh, BCE. Now, in the Egyptian tradition, royalty would intermarry. And so she actually married her half-brother, Tutmos II, same father, different mother. And uh, she it's very interesting. She was a very capable woman. And she, she accepted, she was accepted and acted as the Pharaoh. In, and, and they all knew she was a woman, but she had the ceremonial robes. She even wore a fake beard because that's what Pharaohs had. Even though they knew she was a woman, she acted it in this. Uh, she's buried here. This is her funerary temple. And uh, what's really interesting about Hatshepsut is she was elevated in the culture of Egypt to the position of God's wife, the god Amun, uh, who, was the, uh, who was the god of the uh, sun and the air. And it's very interesting, the name Amun or Amun is, means hidden one or invisible one. And you can draw some parallels to other gods, you know, uh, the unknown god. Uh, that's kind of that position that he took. But what's interesting about this is the highest honor that a woman could receive in Egyptian culture was to be elevated to this position of one of Amun's wives. And that's, that is the reverence that they had for this very, very capable woman. Now, if you're looking at this photo off to the left, which you can't see in the photo, is a tomb. It's called Pit Tomb 33. It has significant interest to some people. Now, there were mummies and artifacts there, but an Italian military pilfered from this area some scrolls. They were given to a merchant by the name of Michael Chandler, who then sold them to a man called Joseph Smith. Those scrolls are what uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reveres as the Book of Abraham uh, today. And uh, we can visit that tomb. You can't go inside, but we, you, you can uh, take pictures of it and see it. So it has enormous significance. Now, uh, as Brandon alluded, it's kind of a hard name to remember, isn't it? It's a long name. And I have told, I've been, uh, both Dan and I have been taking groups to Israel and Egypt. How many decades now, Dan? <laughs> I mean, 30, 40 years have we been taking yeah, groups? I've been going there? back and forth for 48 years. Yeah. I asked Dan once, how many, how many people have I, you know, worked with you, but how many people have I arranged travel to the Holy Land in Egypt? He thought for a minute and said, 30,000. Uh, anyway, just go back to that one slide for a minute. Uh, here's what I've told groups 20, 30 years ago, and they still remember it. Here's how you remember the name of this temple. How did early Christian missionaries, Victorian age, and how did early Mormon missionaries dress? Well, they dressed in a hat and a cheap suit. 
hat cheap suits. And I'm telling you, people 40 years ago still remember the name of this temple. Oh, yeah, a hat and a cheap suit. All right, next slide. Go ahead. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Now, this is something unique to Alma Waterways. Nobody else is doing this because uh, it is quite expensive to get in here, and we include it with your tours. There's no extra charge for you on this. Uh, the tomb of Queen Nefertari. This is a very beautiful and special place. Uh, the, the colors are spectacular. Uh, Dan had even mentioned last time we talked about this, when you walk in, the paint on the walls is so vivid, it looks like it is still wet. Now, the reason yeah, I, I went there when it was closed to the public for a short time from the Ministry of Antiquities there, and they took me in, and I put my face just two inches away from the wall to look at it because it looked like the paint was still wet. And that, it really does. It is one of the most fantastic tombs to visit, and very few people get the opportunity. Very few people get the opportunity. It's very colorful. And it, the reason it's so special is Queen Nefertari was uh, King Ramses II's favorite wife. She was the most beautiful, uh, the most well-educated. He was, he was just so in love with her. And she passed well before he did. And he dedicated this tomb to her. Uh, everything on the walls uh, were dedications from King Ramses uh, to Queen Nefertari. And again, this is unique. Nobody else is going in here. The Temple of Horus. I think, Dan, you were going to go over the Temple of Horus with us. Okay, I, I thought he was going to mention the one of Dandera, but this is the Temple of Edfu. And again, this is on your cruise between Aswan and Luxor. And you'll come to Esna, Edfu, and Colombo, uh, all of which are spectacular tombs. Uh, are spectacular temples that you can visit uh, along the Nile there. Now, as you uh, look at Edfu, where Colombo was built during the uh, time period, really towards the end of the dynasties of Egypt, this one is built more uh, towards the uh, beginning of the Ptolemaic period and prior to that, going clear back to archaic times. Uh, you can see again the visage that you have here. Uh, of being able to walk right through. And there used to be a line of Sphinx along the entryway, just as there were in other temples. But uh, those, of course, were destroyed at one point. Thank you. So this is a really exciting part of the trip. We get to go- I love this one. I just the love it. Yeah, isn't this? I, I mean, I have not been here. That's why I'm so grateful that you guys have all of these wonderful experiences uh, because looking at this, it makes me just want to go on this trip tomorrow. Uh, so the, the Nubian village in Aswan. Uh, so the Nubians are, are similar to our Native Americans here. Like they, they are the first known culture of Africa. Uh, famous for their archery skills. Uh, the drawing that you see on their homes tell the stories of their families. Now, what we do here is a little unique. A lot, everybody gets to tour typically, but once we get you here, you get to have a, a lunch in the local village. And after you're done having lunch, you get to go and shop and you can buy some of the local spices. Uh, you guys have both been here. What are some of the things that you would recommend bringing back as souvenirs or gifts for your friends and family if you had an opportunity to go and shop here? Uh, as you mentioned, Brandon, then I'll let Dan jump in. Uh, most tours have a quick visit. You're in and out. We're going to spend some time. We're going to have lunch. We're going to wander around. We're going to interact with locals on this. But uh, you can get just about anything. But I like the fabrics. They're very, very colorful in this area. Uh, you know, the spices and the souvenirs, a lot of places will cater those to the tourists, so you see some similarity, but you just won't see the fabrics and the vibrancy of the colors everywhere in Egypt like you do here in the Nubian village. Dan? Uh, I was going to say, this gives you a taste of what other areas of Africa is like. Going to this is like you visiting Central Africa, in a sense. There's, uh, with the colors, with the spices, with the things, it's a different setting than, say, the looks or uh, markets and the Concalili and things. Plus, uh, you feel kind of a hometown feeling there when you go through the Nubian village. Uh, it's one of my favorite places just to 
just to go through. <laughs> yeah, and you know what you get is kind of a feeling that you're part of the community, don't you? That's right. Because of the people, you, yeah, it's a hometown. You feel like you're part. Now you get into Cairo. It's a big city, and you know, and the other places you're a visitor, but here there's just that feeling that yeah, you are part of them right now. Spectacular. By the way, just one thing about the Nubian village also. Sure. And that is, you're exactly right. A lot of people go to Aswan. They may be told about it. They may see a little tiny portion, but they're rushed out of there real quick. And they don't really get to feel what you're going to feel on this trip by taking the, the time to go into the Nubian village. And everything I've heard is the culture is so warm and inviting oh. that you really want that time with the people. That's right. Shopping is great, but the people make you want to be there. And That's you will, and we will have interaction with the locals there, which is just fantastic. Uh, this is very special, uh, Larry. I know that you were very excited to talk about. Yeah, this, this well. is a this is a really fun one. Uh, uh, Abu Simbel, uh, originally built in the 13th century BCE, uh, not in its present location. It was built. It was actually cut right out of the rock, and uh, uh, there's statues of Ramses II and uh, his uh, his uh, favorite wife Nefertari. Now we, of course, are visiting her tomb. Uh, she was the favorite wife of Nefertari, Ramses II, and Dan um, Ramses II um, is one of the possibilities of the Pharaoh at the time of Moses. You know, I think a lot of historians put it at Seti or Ramses II, uh, but this, and we'll get into some of that later, this original uh, temple, it's an ancient temple complex. Uh, now, what was, for civic reasons, they were, they're gonna dam up the river, the Aswan Dam, and it would completely cover and submerge this priceless temple. And so what they did is they literally cut it into pieces. Keep in mind, originally this was uh, all cut out of the rock. They cut it up and they transported it some five, 600 feet. That's all up uh, the top. <laughs> yeah. They, <laughs> That was quite a project. That's right. They put it up to the top of the hill. When you're and talking so about you can look over where it originally was, but here it is as it would have appeared at that uh, time. And inside, you have two temples built by Ramses II. And again, um, uh, we'll have Egyptologists with us. I'll be there to do some of the commentary. Uh, Dan, anything you want to add on Abu? Uh, yeah, if you look down at the feet between the legs, oh, yeah. <laughs> you'll notice there's another figure standing there. That, of oh, course, is Ramsey's favorite wife. I didn't dare mention this, Dan, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> His favorite wife, Nefertari, and so forth. She was actually a second wife, but that's uh, the one, but his most chosen one, and she's down at the feet, which is giving her honor there, and he's represented with his height and might and power uh, a megalomaniac, so to speak, and uh, and looking like a god. Now, this is an optional tour, so uh, we have to fly you there to get you uh, to Abu Simbel. Uh, it's yeah. three hundred and twenty-five dollars. If and you can pre-book that through reservations. You want to pre-book this because we are the only company that guarantees if you pre-book it through reservations, you will actually go. Nobody else is able to do that. We're able to work something out with the locals that we are able to make that happen. If you wait to the last minute and you're on board and you book it, there's no guarantee because if there's no space, we can't get you there. So I was just, I, I'm sorry, Brandon. I was just going to mention, uh, this is trust, trust us. Add this and you you could just call your Columbus travel advisor and he or she will add it to your reservation. Um, if you wait until, as Brandon said, so you're on the boat, the price is the same and it's a bargain at that price, but there's no guarantee that you'll go. You know, with what you're investing to go on this, 
it's trust Larry time at Abu Simbal, and you do that with your Columbus travel advisor. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is a one-time experience for many. All right, well, another stop along the way, we're gonna to go to uh, Kam Abo. Is that correct? Did I pronounce that right, Dan? Oh, uh, it's, you know, of course, in the village of, Kombo, of Ombo, but it's uh, uh, the temple there, which was built in about the second century BC by the, what's called the Ptolemies. Now you've heard of Cleopatra. She was the seventh with that name, Cleopatra the seventh, that you hear about with Julius Caesar and so forth. This was uh, built just about a century before her, and it's by the Greek culture after Alexander had conquered Egypt. Uh, but they based it all based on the ancient temples. And uh, as you can see, it was once uh, heavily damaged, but it's one of the special places. It's one of the 10 uh, most important, actually among the top six temples to be visited uh, in Egypt. And lots of mummified crocodiles, correct? Yes, this is the crocodile. Of course, the crocodile, Sobek, was also represented of the power of the Pharaoh. Uh, for those of you that may be Latter-day Saints, if you look in facsimile number one, you'll see in the base of it, uh, you'll see a crocodile figure, which is also interpreted the same way as representing the god Pharaoh. Excellent. Pharaoh Thank meaning great house. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And then Karnak. I can't can't go here without visiting Karnak. So, well, of course, the Karnak Temple Complex, 250 acres. It's the second largest temple complex in the world. The largest is another favorite place of mine, Angkor Wat, Cambodia. And in a shameless moment of self-promotion, I have an Ama Waterways uh, cruise in Southeast Asia. We'll visit Angkor Wat. We have an option to Thailand, uh, but it's, it's uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The actual cruise is Cambodia and Vietnam, but we can visit Thailand also. Angkor Wat is actually the largest temple complex. I'm taking that group November of this year, and we will be having a webinar on the Mekong in Southeast Asia, February the 2nd. I think it's at seven o'clock, but you, you can sign up for that. So, but that'll be with Ama Waterways also. Well, back to Karnak. Um, this one's the Luxor Temple here. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, talking about uh, the Luxor. Karnak, yeah. yeah, the Temple of Luxor. Um, you'll find uh, the obelisk columns, statues, uh, Karnak and Luxor are across the um, river from each other. And as I mentioned, generally on the east side, we're seeing temples of worship and ceremonies. On the west side, more funerary temples. Dan? I was just going to say they're actually in line with each other. And there were processions that led from this temple on into and the regular festivals and things, leading the having the gods on a uh, bark, if you will, a, a small vessel, yeah. and they would lead that annually during festivals and everything. Now, you'll see a lot of destruction, in particularly the Luxor Temple versus that of the Karnak, where there are also a lot, but you'll see that faces and other things are damaged, and you'll see that's because when the Christian culture came in, then that became uh, anathema, that became something that uh, paganism. was disgraceful paganism. in speaking. Yeah, pagan, and therefore they destroyed faces and parts and things. Uh, luckily, so much of it was under the sand <laughs> that they only destroyed that that they could reach. And when you go to the Luxor Temple, you're going to see a building uh, there that's way up in the sky, but that's where the sand was that covered the Luxor Temple. And you'll see a Coptic uh, 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 building there that's located up high. You know, one of the nice features, again, of our cruise and tours, we'll have three uh, uh, professional Egyptologists on board. And so we're dividing ourselves into groups of about 20 rather than a tour group of 40, 50 with one guide. So, and, and we will have in-depth discussions, that not only of the history, but of the significance of these. 
uh, Hathor. Dan, why don't you tell yeah, us? Let me just about talk because this is Pandera. one of the places I always love to go to, but I'm one of the few that does it. And to hear that Amaways is going to Bandera and Abydos, cruises don't do that very often. <laughs> this is another one of those special things that sets it apart from almost any other traditional cruise that goes on the Nile. They'll go Aswan de Luxor, but they don't do uh, Dandera and Abydos like you'll get to see. And here at Dandera, again, this was built during the Ptolemaic period, that period including the period of, uh, of Cleopatra VII. In fact, on the walls of the Dandera temple, you'll see her consort, which was uh, uh, her son through Julius Caesar. And again, this is the most complete built temple with its ceiling and everything uh, that uh, yep. exists of all the temples in Egypt. It's the most complete one. And when you go inside, you're going to see fantastic wall paintings. You go clear up onto the top of the roof and you go in and there is this uh, calendar, the Zodiac uh, calendar there uh, with the centerpiece being the, looks like a ram's uh, leg or rather a cow's leg, but in fact, it's the Big Dipper and the whole calendar, 365 day calendar uh, there is represented. And that's where we get ours from ancient Egypt. And then here it is represented yeah. it's now in the Louvre, but it's replaced there. You know, uh, in just a few minutes, we'll be talking about, as we finish the slides, the Egyptian enthronement or endowment. Uh, but here at Dandera, the I might call it the Greek version of the temple endowment was yeah. conducted. And There's so, just one thing on the slide to point right, out. On the Look side over to your right, and you can see on that, uh, see a palm tree. Yeah. You know what that is, and why that's there? That, in fact, is where the garden area is as part of that Egyptian uh, endowment, if you will, or power that, was, that they would learn through knowledge. And that was a garden area. The public actually could come into all of this area. Right, the garden area. Well, the garden area, this yeah. big platform area and everything. These were like fortresses too with the wall around them. Yeah. Oh, you'll learn so much. It's yeah, like, this, so. yeah. Uh, Brandon. Oh, let me just tell you this. I, I can let you discuss it, Brandon, but I told you there was a once in a lifetime uh, surprise that we do when we fly back from Luxor to Cairo, and it's the Abdeen Presidential Palace. Brandon? Did, again, this is unique. Nobody else does this. Uh, and, and the reason we do this, okay, so you're going to see a lot of temples and tombs along the way here. We want to kind of break it up and give you something a little different. So we go to the Presidential Palace. Uh, so we get to explore here. We get to dine here. This is where dignitaries from around the world stay when they come to visit Egypt. Again, nobody else does this. Uh, it's something else that is quite costly, but it is just included. We want you to have the most amazing experience that you can possibly have while you're traveling with us. This you know, palace to put this into perspective, to Egypt, this is what the White House is to us in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's the presidential palace. It's not just a conference center. It's a presidential palace where if um, the U.S. president were to visit, well, like Obama did, President Obama went to Egypt. He was received at this, the Abdeen presidential palace. And I think we're going to have lunch there. Yes, you will have lunch yeah. there and you will get to visit. Uh, there's a multitude of museums within the palace. You will also get to see those museums as well. And again, well. this is exclusive and private. This just that isn't is done. That is correct. Okay, Brandon, go. And, and then we're going to finish off your trip here with one more post night in Cairo. Uh, this is old Cairo. Dan, I'll actually turn this over to you because I know that this is, this is your, your wheelhouse. <laughs> well, of course, uh, you're visiting not only the uh, Coptic Cairo, but here you're going to visit the Islamic where Muhammad Ali had uh, built his mosque and so forth up there. I assume you're going into the only one that's comparison to this as far as uh, historical archaeological importance is one in Istanbul. Uh, 
there. And this uh, of Muhammad Ali uh, of the early uh, 19th century and so forth, even though it was built much, much earlier than that, this is where uh, you'll find the heart of Islam in Egypt. And uh, going there is an experience, walking through, uh, uh, being able to visit in the courtyards, hear the uh, call to prayer from the minarets and other things. Again, it's a special part. And going between Coptic Cairo and the Trier Square and coming out here to this portion of, of uh, Cairo to go up onto the citadel there and all is... Uh, uh, you're going to pass the city of the dead. <laughs> and that'll be an experience for you as well as you pass through that, where people actually live in the cemeteries that look like buildings and things, the cenotaphs that are built there and so forth. And coming in here uh, to this, uh, it's a well-rounded experience. I can only compliment uh, Ama, Way, Ama Waterways on them setting up this kind of package. I've never seen it with a cruise package like this in uh, in Egypt. I've seen a, a lot of others and they do marvelous things, but this one for a, for just a cruise package itself is one of the best I've ever seen. And Dan, that's why we're Larry's favorite. We do so many different things. We put it together unique. We truly create the most amazing vacation experiences you will ever have. And I can attest to that myself and I don't know Larry can as well. Well, since you took the time to join us, I do have a couple of show specials for you. So anybody who makes a booking within the next two weeks, you'll get a hundred per person discount. And the way a booking works is you get a seven day courtesy hold. So technically you have three weeks to make a deposit to go on a trip with us. And deposits vary based on destination. Uh, for Egypt, that's 1200 per person, Europe 400 per person, and then Africa is a little bit more than that. <laughs> but I do have another unique offer. This is only for Columbus travel. You will not find it anywhere else. Uh, if you are looking to make a trip to Europe, um, for this year, if you are able to make it, if we are all able to make it, I have a two for one offer. This is a BOGO. We don't do two for ones. It is not our way of doing business, but I have this special thing put together. It's our impressions of the same in Paris. It is a brand new itinerary. It is extremely popular and it is set right at the perfect time, August 12th of this year. Uh, for more information, there are terms and conditions. I've got them right up here. But reach out to your local, to your travel advisor at Columbus Travel, and they will make sure that you're taken care of. Uh, Larry, your team always takes incredible care of everybody yeah, when we do I'll, these events. I'll just make a quick comment. There's different promotions. Some, it's like a free air or a free companion airfare. They come and go. You pick one promotion, not all of them and you just find out which one works best. This particular cruise, you call Ama Direct, you can't get it. Nope. This is a special thank you for you and because you joined us tonight. And if, if you have friends or family that are not with us tonight, but are gonna go with you to Europe, you can do that. Uh, Brandon, are we done with Egypt and the Nile? We are done with okay. Egypt and the Nile. You guys, uh, <laughs> you have the floor. Okay, couple things we wanna talk about. First of all, a reminder, uh, my wife Kathy and I will be personally hosting the March 18th, 2022. As of this morning, there were two cabins left. We have added a March 11th departure. Uh, that will not be hosted, but you'll have the Egyptologist. You'll do everything that we have. They won't be hosted by me or Dan. Uh, and then we have a March 24th, 2023. Now we've got about 12 minutes left. We do want to end on time. I might add for those who are going to Egypt on any of these departures, Dan and I will be doing some cultural firesides, webinars, cultural awareness as we go through the year. And uh, the things that we've talked about, Dan and I will go into a lot of detail. One of the things we've been asked, to, we've been specifically asked to talk about, and I'll lead out in it, and then Dan, I'll have you uh, come in, is the so-called, uh, it's a temple ceremony. Now, I want to emphasize that everything we talk about 
is only as was practiced in ancient Egypt. It's verifiable. One of the best books on the Egyptian endowment was written by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Uh, it is out of print now because it came out, what, 20, 30 years ago. You can see a lot of this online. But again, everything we talk about is only practices that are uh, historically verified in ancient Egypt. Uh, an endowment is, um, an endowment, you know, coming from the old Latin is a gift uh, to bestow. And the Egyptian endowment was believed a gift that bestowed power. I'm going to go through what the step-by-step -step of what's done and then ask Dan to come in and talk about uh, some of the significance of it. The pharaohs and the nobles would participate in this. And it was really a practice run for the eternities. It was believed that after one died, they would go through the same ceremony. And to do it now was to, was to make sure your life was in order and that um, you were familiar with and that you could go through it. So uh, a noble, the noble families, the noble people, the royalty would go in. They would enter the temple accompanied by the temple priests. They would change their clothes. At that point, they would be uh, ceremoniously washed with water, not a drenching, but ceremoniously, and anointed with oil. They would receive a different name that they would take with them. And then they would proceed through the Egyptian temple uh, with a commentary and discussion by the priests of the creation. Uh, they would uh, have a discussion of what they believed that the world, fell, uh, the fall of a perfect world, uh, they, uh, a journey through chaos. The Egyptians used the term chaos to represent the evil in the world today. And so we are journeying through a, a lowly earthly world uh, with temptations and problems and uh, obstacles that, uh, that we have to grow and overcome. And again, I'm condensing it. When we do our, our webinars, firesides, lectures in preparation, we'll go into laborious detail. And by the way, all of this you can see in Nibley's book. You can see it online in reliefs. And then we come to a final judgment. Now, there's a very interesting practice that would be done. It's called a circle dance. And it was where uh, they'd actually dance. There'd actually be music to celebrate life. And the, the petitioners, the pharaohs or the royal family or the nobles, I'll call the petitioners or participants, would be circled by the priests. And they would form a circle and they would unite in prayer in this particular circle. And then uh, 42 questions are asked. They're called the 42 questions of uh, Ma'at. And they would be, are you virtuous? See, this is to determine if they are worthy, if they are able to proceed uh, to the next step. And are you virtuous? Do you help your neighbor? Um, uh, do you show reverence to the gods? Are you morally clean? Uh, do you have good thoughts? The very, uh, you know, the, by the way, you can get these questions online, but I've seen many versions of the 42 questions and it really gets down to who is translating it. They're generally the same, specifically different in the translations. But one, that, one translation that I really like, the very last question is, is there one person, you only have to name one, who is glad that you are alive. That's kind of a self-reflective question. I turned to Kathy and I said, Kathy, I need one. Can you help me out here? She says, talk to me at 10 o'clock tonight and I'll let you know. Uh, so I may get held up at that point. Well, if you, if you satisfactorily, and I'm watching my clock, Dan, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to cut my part short so we can get to you. But if you successfully answer the 42 questions of Ma'at, you are then taken to a partition or a veil. The priest will be behind it. And at that point, some questions will be asked. 
and it's kind of like they believed a magic spell or or knowledge would be exchanged that would allow the participant or the practitioner to pass through the veil. And at that point, uh, and you can Google this one, holy embrace, the, the, the priest behind the veil, a hand would be extended, there would be embraced, uh, toes and knees would touch, and this, this information or this magic spell is, is exchanged that allows the petitioner to come through the veil. And then when they die, they believe they'd be resurrected and live for eternity. And it's really interesting at that final judgment, they, they believe like there's a scale, there's your heart and a feather. And uh, uh, you, if you're good, it, it factors into the scale. Now, we've got about five or six minutes. I've got so much more. Uh, they, they use symbols like they would hold a vessel of water. I'm going to stand up. They would hold a vessel of water in this hand, not by the handle, but they would hold it like this. This would be one of the Egyptian hand symbols. They also had a, a, a um, builder's square, you know, like an L, and they would raise the other hand to that L or builder's square. And so the hand symbols were very important in the Egyptian endowment. I got to stop because I want Dan to finish it out. But that's, that is just a thumbnail sketch of what we'll be talking about. Dan? And yes, again, again all these things I, excuse, represented. Every, excuse me, Dan. Everything I said is only from the Egyptian ceremony. That's it. That's all. Okay. And of course, these Egyptian ceremonies extended out even into the Roman and Greek cultures and Mesopotamian cultures. Uh, really the trip you're going on is a temple trip as well, because you're going to see actually more than most tri uh, trips do of the most significant temples in all of Egypt when you go on the Amaway's uh, tour. But uh, let's talk a little bit about that endowment, as he said. What the Egyptians saw was this was uh, that when the world was created, as it was created and so forth, it came out of chaos. And Atum uh, brought these things together. He had children of the gods that we'll explain and so forth. It'll be explained by your Egyptologists. But at any rate, chaos is that evil without control, without dominion. It becomes the hell, if you will, of Christian tradition. But it's worse than the Christ Christian tradition of hell. But at any rate, out of that comes then the gods who form and bring life into existence. That is the worlds of planets and puts order to them. And the way to avoid chaos was by use of, of faith, intelligence, mind. And it was their knowledge that enabled them to control and keep the world from going into chaos. And thus the temples became the center place for such studies. Uh, for instance, the, the idea of universities came really from the European, Greek, and other cultures, but the true universities anciently were the temples. The temples served in many, many different functions. Let me just run through a real list real quickly. There was a university of study and learning in all fields of knowledge, from mathematics to you name it, an uh, uh, astronomical observatory to determine the, determine the and measure the movements of the heavens, times, and seasons, a sacred place to receive the oracles of the gods, a dwelling place of the gods, and a place to enter their presence, a treasury of the wealth of the nations. It was a banking system of the ancient world, a place of worship and prayer, a place of governance of nations, a place of enthronement of kings and priests, a place of refuge and peace, and their funerary buildings for preparation for the afterlife. In essence, the temple was considered symbolically both locally in regions, towns, and cities, as well as in the national capital, the center place of the universe, next to the throne of the gods themselves. Larry mentioned the circle dance. Just to give you a few ideas that are just tidbits that we can give much later in some of the other seminars. A circle represents that idea of eternity. It's drawn by a compass. Uh, and in that uh, type of symbol that they use, uh, it symbolized the eternal circle of all things. The circle represented the whole of eternity encompassing the universe 
symbolizing the sun and the founder of all creation. Within it, all knowledge and truth was contained and had no end. It was the halo, which is a symbol to designate the gods, uh, that was placed above the gods and above the pharaohs to represent that symbol of the gods. Another token uh, that was placed upon the burial dead, by the way, the compass was placed on the breast of the burial dead, and so was the uh, uh, builder square with the plumb bob. Uh, these two symbols they found in the tombs and so forth on the bodies. These uh, represented exactness in, in both measurement and undeviating in movement. Uh, when you raised an arm in Egyptian culture to the square, it was uh, the symbol of promise that you would be undeviating, that you would be obedient, that you would follow that. And there's so many other symbols, symbols of eternal life, the power and authority, the laws, uh, scepter, stability and health and truth and all these that you'll see. The anointing and washing is very significant with the clothing and so forth. These are all enthronement things to become as one of the gods, uh, kings of heaven and earth. Uh, well, the symbol of Mot and so forth is the way in which one uh, be, is able to uh, overcome chaos. And that is the concept of truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality, and justice. In fact, the scales weighed the heart against the feather was in fact Ma'at too, as well as the foundation stone. And there so Ma'at was this idea. But we could go on with many yeah. other things. It's well, we're gonna we're gonna have some seminars during the year. They're optional, of course, but we will go into a lot of detail. We'll provide materials for you. This trip to Egypt really is like no other. So uh, the dates again: March 11th uh, next year, March 18th next year. That's the one I'll be on, and March 24th, 2023. I'll be on that one also. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you have follow-up questions, let me give you my email and either Dan or I will uh, respond to it. Dan, can I give your email also? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, mine is gelwix at ctrav.com or you can call me here at Columbus Travel. That's G E L. W I X at ctrav.com. That's C as in Charlie, T R A V as in Victor.com. Dan's is much easier to remember. Dan Hone, and Dan is with two N's D A N N Hone, H O N E at Gmail. And we'll be happy to respond to you. And by the way, uh, Dan also has some study abroad programs for high school and college age students for your kids or grandkids, send him a note on that. So there's so much more, but uh, we're gonna wrap it up now. Uh, uh, Brandon, any parting comments before we say goodbye? I just wanna thank you all for joining us. Larry, thank you for putting this together. As always, this is wonderful. It's great connecting with you, Dan. Thank you so much for all of your valuable input. And I look forward to the next one. All right. Uh, thanks to all of you. Stay healthy, stay safe. God bless you and your families and all that you do. And if things work out on one of those three dates, we'd love to see you in Egypt with us. All right. All the best. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, I hope. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye. Masalam.